We're back, Brendan. Here we are, two Irish guys discussing software. We are. The last show of 2021. Can you believe it? I can't believe it at all. Well, I always say that. I have to say, can you believe it? I can't believe it. Unless we're going to do a show next week. I well, certainly no, well, it's December, middle of December now. We're getting ready for Christmas week. It yes. is, uh, yeah, we've got a end of year. We did a load of predictions last year. Do you remember any of them? You look them up. Did you remember any of them? Not a, not a one. This is part of our preparation. Oh, well, I did. I had one we prepared for, uh, we said we'd do it, that China would start regulating. Mm. I think they just sort of just... I don't know what they did. I think they are. I think they're totally right. They're all over everybody. I think copying, all their companies copying, copying Europe and the US. Yeah. Well, they get they're more extreme. They've taken companies off the stock. The American stock exchanges. They're, you know, people. The people are being disappeared. Uh, it's like traditional. Uh, yeah. How do we regulate people? I, I'm kind of wondering. Should we be careful what we're saying? <laughs> yeah, China's definitely regulating. Yeah, well, yeah. Review this we'll, 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 we'll 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 move we'll move on. <laughs> We have a great show, though. This is we're going to do kind of a bit of a summary of what's happening during the year. We're going to we're going to have a chat about maybe what's happening next year. But there is a big news story which is impacting our industry, software industry, and it's the uh, security incident that happened about a week ago, I think. And we'll all remember uh, Ben Lebinsky, who is one of our team and was a guest at our podcast during the summer. Ben is going to join us this time at the beginning of the show. We're going to start with Change the guest. We're going to just just to really mess people's heads up. We're going to start at the beginning of the show. Ben, you're with us. How are you? You're not physically with us, but you're remotely there. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm well, thank you. Well, it's been a it's been a long few weeks, but uh, <laughs> we're doing well, thank you. Yeah, you've had a crazy uh, ten days, haven't you? Uh, tell us this this log for uh, J incident or log for Shell is is it also known as? A security incident, if I'm not mistaken, came to light at the end of last week. Somebody was playing Fortnite. Was it? Or was it Minecraft? It's my one Minecraft, of yeah. <laughs> it was Minecraft. Well, lots of people, I'd say. Yeah, it was one of those games that my my, my son plays. Uh, they're all the same to me, sorry. Uh, that's just showing my age big time. Minecraft, uh, and they exploited something within Minecraft that then became a huge ins- issue for almost every company out there. Isn't that correct? Tell yeah, us that's more. correct. I mean, we, we, we're not entirely sure how long this vulnerability, well, we're not entirely sure how long this vulnerability had been exploited before this, but yes, some someone decided to see if they could inject a calculator, I think it was, into Minecraft and achieved it, launched a Twitter post, very quickly appeared on GitHub. Very quickly after that, there was exploits following up with it. So really, this was uh, the speed at which this vulnerability became known was one factor. But equally, the fact that Log4j uh, is, a, is a sort of essentially a Java library, which is used by numerous developers for, for tracking events and, and has a, a quite a good amount of functionality, it's everywhere, it seems. Um, so the, the, the biggest challenge here is have everyone caught all these little instances of it. It doesn't matter where it is in your system. If it's there, you could be vulnerable. But how did it end up everywhere? Well, this is, I think this is, this is this great software supply chain, uh, sec, DevSecOps conundrum. I think this is just really demonstrating it to the forefront. You know, some major software suppliers will have, will have leveraged a Java solution maybe, but maybe not deep enough to see what that solution, that open source solution was, leveraging below so but is everybody copying everybody else's stuff then <laughs> i mean i thought it was where, it is that way. what happened to intellect, what happened to intellectual property rights well this is this, this is one of these particular you know the, it, it's if we're talking about perfect storm you know this is open source so the, you know the, these little bits of code are there for everyone everyone to use you know uh, and with its enhanced you know with its sort of the functionality it, it can offer you know, people have, have been jumping on it and, and using it for years. So not only is the speed of the identification, but I guess the, the longevity of how, uh, of the time that these this file was slowly introduced, sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly, into large enterprise systems. And tell me, what's going to happen? Like, has anything bad happened out there? Tell, give, us, give us a kind of a feel. I mean, I heard there was 840,000 attacks alone in the first 72 hours of this thing. 
when very few people knew about it. Yeah. What's yeah. happening? What's what's happening today? It's gone. It's gone. Well, I mean, yeah, with early days, we I was seeing stats of two hundred and eighty thousand attempts of exploitation an hour globally. Uh, we we have one a member of our team that had been working on a, a fairly small website, and he'd seen seven hundred attempts just within a, a day or so. And this is a, a you know a small unknown website. You know, there's there's evidence that this ex, they're, they're leveraging various bots to to employ this uh, exploit. So it, it's been automated, if you will, to discover it. But this, the outcome of this, I think, will, will go on for a, for a good long time. IT and cyber teams were encouraged to act fast, but they're acting fast on what they can find. You know, so there's a couple of pieces at play here is, have you found all these instances in your environment? And have you taken the recommended mitigating steps to, to, to address this vulnerability? Question mark one, but how many threat actors, if at all, managed to get in before you shut the door? You know, how do you know whether they're already in your system? And these threat actors not may, may not make their move today. They may not make their move in, you know, in six months. It's going to get, you know, harder and harder and just elevated due diligence from IT and cyber teams will be required, not only for the, the indicators compromise of Log4J, but any subsequent malicious activity on their enterprise networks. And Ben, the, tr the threat actors, you know, I've read about state, which I, you know, sometimes find it hard to believe some of this is state sponsored, right? Uh, which is kind of always curious to me, but are they working in unison? Are they working in concert to, to, together? Like, like, okay, there's a vulnerability, you know, in, in Log4j, do they all know about it at the same time? Like, what, what, how is it happening on such a mass scale? I think, again, it's this media, you know, it was on Twitter, it was on GitHub, it, it, it was very available, and it's not an overly complicated uh, attack, plus the exploits, you know, how to exploit it was, was launched, I think I saw it the Saturday after the event, and, and I, I, I wouldn't say they're necessarily working in unison, but they are all certainly racing to exploit this vulnerability before the door is shut by the defending, the defending teams. There is, you know, there is evidence of, of known threat actors using this that may or may not be associated with, with uh, nation states. But there are also evidence of, should we say, opportunist criminals, if you will, trying to install crypto mining technologies uh, on, onto people's machines. So, so give us a, like an example. Are people going to put ransomware kind of code inside people's organizations? That's what we're trying to do. They'll let her do something now or they'll hide in the long grass and come back to you in six months time and say, right, we've encrypted, we're going to shut down all your systems, we're going to disable your, your network, we're going to whatever, all through this vulnerability. Thank yeah, you. That quite high, highly, highly possible, highly likely. Yes, they, they may take action straight away. Um, I suspect that we will continue to find people that have used this, as I say, this vulnerability to get in. Um, and then either they may act ransomware would be a, a potential one or data exfiltration or they may sell their access if you will to 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 another group to to conduct the act but it, it, we're still learning more and more about how this has been leveraged and what it's you know what its potential you know net impact to the, to the victim is uh, as we go but this you know it's all highly likely oh, has actually anything bad actually happened yet though or is it just people are scrambling to close the door? Uh, as far as I know today, it, it's people have been scrambling to close the door, but it will be challenging to attribute, you know, this door to a, to a cyber attack. Just because Log4j has been occurring has not stopped other cyber attacks taking yeah, place. They, they all happen anyway. This goes on all the exactly. time. Anyway, so this is like, this is, this is big news because it's, a, it's a, what we, I think the term he uses is a zero day incident. And actually, it'd probably be bigger news if we weren't all talking about Omicron, or Omicron, I should say, uh, <laughs> put the N in there, like by accident. But, you know, so it's like, this stuff goes on anyway. So it, it is big news, though, isn't it? Yeah, that, no one, you know, no one's prepared for this, ultimately, is what it means. You know, there was, the, the systems weren't tuned, they weren't looking for it. Um, it's not as simple as uh, spin out a patch. You know, there, there is a level of functionality. So, so the effort required to, to identify it and then act is, is, is equally massive. And so we've also got to remember about the, the smaller companies out there, which 
one, may not even realize they have it present in their systems, or two, have the resource to act at, you know, a, a sufficient speed. You know, when you're starting to then look at the security of supply chains, it could be these smaller companies that are subsequently uh, exploited, but are delivering essential and critical services to, to bigger, well-known brands. Even the week of the, the event, you know, aware of uh, ransomware attacks on Irish medical facilities and also a, a well-known retailer. Whilst the IT teams are, are rapidly going out trying to find, is Log4j present? Is it a vulnerable version? What action do we need to take? And do we know anything about the characteristics of companies that will could fall into that, whether you're big or small? Like, is it, do you have a certain type of, be in certain industry, or do you have to be, have all your systems in the cloud or all the systems on, you know, what, are there any characteristics at all that could say you're, you're probably safer or any characteristics say that you're probably more at risk? Unfortunately, none that I've seen. Quite often in these events, we could, you know, at a broad level, distinguish between enterprise systems and uh, operational technologies. You, you could argue that maybe the operational technologies are, are, are less likely to impact it, be impacted, but being the, the vast presence of this, this file, it, it's really hard, really hard to say. Early indications said that people were focusing on, on business systems, but irrespective of cloud or, or enterprise, it, it's wherever you have, a, I guess, a, you're connected to the internet, you know, you're potentially, potentially vulnerable. The other, the other fear here is as is, is, is time passes, the tools and techniques used by the threat actors could be evolved to become more sophisticated to avoid immediate detection capabilities. But for the moment, I think it's just, you know, we're in mad race territory to try and use it in its simplest guise before the door shut. And a very kind of rudimentary question, I might be a bit stupid as well, but is it a case of I've got Log4j version, you know, whatever, seven, and I just replace it now with the next, uh, you know, immediately available version that's been patched by the open source community, or is it just far more complicated than that? I wish it was. I wish it was like that. It just, just to give you the, the story. So, you know, a, a new version was released that that should address it, and, and this introduces a couple of complexities. The first one it was it was two point one five, but very quickly vulnerabilities were found in that patch. You know that that new version, and so those companies that were quick to roll out the new version suddenly found themselves being exploited under another CVE. So then two point one six came out. Equally. It's not always known what Log4j does within your system. So if you take action to address this vulnerability, you could inadvertently be stopping your own operations by removing a, a core functionality. It is not all versions of uh, Log4j that are, are vulnerable to the, to the Log4Shell element, but some of them, again, are vulnerable to other vulnerabilities that have been captured. So, you, you know, a, a version 1.x, if you will, may not be impacted by log for shell but it has its own vulnerability. So it's unfortunately not as uh, simple from both an operational or a, a security component in terms of addressing it. You really have to look at and balance that risk, which is the greater risk here. It feels and sounds uncomfortably like, you know, the COVID pandemic. It's, just, <laughs> it's evolving and changing and, you know. Two, I think two, it's a good analogy. Flatten the, scur the, flatten the curves. <laughs> so, how has the industry reacted and how have we reacted? Like what's been the... Re like the industry, as in the kind of the software companies and the support companies like ourselves, how, how has the industry reacted? Who's, the, who's reacted well? Who's reacted badly, maybe? I think, especially given the time of year as well, I, I think it caught a lot of people off guard. On the whole, I, I think the industry's reacted rapidly and well. I have been quite impressed about how people have got together uh, and shared intelligence and shared information. Have, have demonstrated more openness. Uh, not everyone, but I, I'd say on the whole, people have demonstrated more openness, appreciating the, the extent of this, the potential impact from this vulnerability. For us as a I, I couldn't say I'd be more proud or impressed of, of the team. You know, everyone stood up to the challenge and the ask, it's involved everyone from our L1 desk to, you know, to initiation and coordination, our communications, marketing and strategy teams, uh, in terms of getting the messaging out to our customers and, and, and keeping that tempo rolling. And then pretty much all our, all our GIEs have, have stood up to the mark, you know, led by our tech council to support our customers in, in the identification of this file set and then take appropriate action. Plus, 
all those due diligence questions of before and actions taken place. So that that really sort of frame the arm around our customers to to help them out. Well, listen, Ben, thank you to you and to the wider team. Uh, we really appreciate appreciate your efforts. We know that you've been working up very little sleep over the last week. Um, we won't take up any more of your time. Uh, really appreciate you joining us and uh, we'll be talking to you separately anyway. So thanks, thanks a million, Ben. Appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. Merry Christmas. Yeah, Christmas. Christmas. thanks, thanks. Wow, that is... Oh my God, yeah, it's so like what's been going on over the last two yeah, years, isn't it? It's changing and it's evolving and you're trying to keep up. <clears throat> yeah, so it sounds a bit scary, but uh, it sounds like Ben and the team are on top of it, which is great. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, these things eventually do sort themselves out, as most things eventually. Just have, it's a matter of time. Uh, but we're still at the end of the year. It's been a big year for a lot of big companies. Again, making lots of money. Uh, we've been tracking this through the year. You've been giving me some numbers on some of the stuff. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's been a big year. I, I, I you know, really like some of the numbers. I know your favorite man, Larry. You know, I heard, I heard he made even more money again. Oh, He's um, is he number number three in the world? Oh, the wealthiest oh, man there. I'm actually feeling a little ill now, but but uh, yeah. So like Oracle had a reasonable Q2, and uh, they were up six percent year on year. Uh, so they beat their the market expectations on that. So there was ten point ten point three billion of revenue. I guess we got to give credit where credit's due. Yeah. Yeah. So How much of that was audit revenue, though? Yeah. Can we have the breakdown, yeah. please? The yeah. cloud is kind of hidden in there somewhere, I'm sure. Yeah. But uh, their shares were up kind of 11% on extended trading last Friday. And, you know, they're up 40% year to date. So, uh, like, I was looking at some of the stock, you know, prices and some of the curves. And they've got a, you know, decent-looking curve right there. And uh, the s and is only up 25%. So, they're beating the S&P. Uh, they've done pretty well. So, it's kind of hard to uh, to, to knock that. Um, like, this, the, the spike you mentioned, Larry, it added $16 billion just Friday. Last Friday, and it was horrible. So, I can see your face. <laughs> To Larry, to personal, Larry. Oh, personal uh, fortune. I, I think this year that's, that contributes 16 billion to the 50 billion he has added to his net fortune. 46 billion coming that, could, from that. Couldn't, ha- couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Yeah, no, yes, lovely. <laughs> and four, four, 4 billion coming from his investments in uh, in Tesla. So just the, the cool 50, 50 billion. But, uh, but look, in comparison, it sounds great. Doesn't it? 6%. I, yeah, it, sounds great. I think it probably isn't, though, is it? Well, when you compare it to, you know, others, yeah. right? So, like, it's very hard. I mean, it, in they're isolation, big. you yeah. say 6%. But Amazon Amazon is a, it has a 33% share of the, mark, of the cloud market. Like, Amazon is not in the top five. It's kind of low single digit still. And Amazon's Q2 cloud revenue is going to be up 37% year on year uh, wow. to, to 16 billion. So, it's kind of like... 16 billion just for my cloud revenue versus your 10 billion overall, which is only up 6% year to year. So it kind of puts it in perspective. So, uh, you know, every every uh, silver lining has a cloud <laughs> as, 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 uh, for, for Larry. Um, and also there was a bit of a, a cloud over his, his uh, announcements because albeit they had net income of pretty impressive 2.4 billion, they actually took a, a 1.25 billion net loss over this kind of long, lingering, decade-long uh, dispute over former CEO uh, and formerly and deceased, uh, may rest in peace, Mark Hurd, who was the CEO of HP. And yeah, went into, yeah. To be co-CEO. Uh, so there was a dispute uh, and uh, with HP over that, it's long, long running and I think it's now settled, but it, but it cost them a lot of money and mm. so they took a net loss of 1.25. So, you know, it's not all fantastic no. news, you know. But so some good news for Larry. Did we go back to that thirty three percent growth in 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 was it thirty three you said? Well, uh, uh, Amazon, Amazon. Amazon. Yeah, well, they've got a thirty three percent share, and their red cloud revenue is up thirty seven. Thirty seven percent. Wow. Okay. So like they're only six. Now, hey. if you compare that to let's say let's say compared to to IBM. IBM. <laughs> well, IBM's revenue in a comparable period, I think Q two of, of this year, uh, year on year, they were up 01 percent uh, year on year. So they, you know, at seventeen billion for the quarter. That oh, actually, if you exclude Kindrel, it's two point five percent. So it's like two point five, not point seven, but or point one. But uh, um, and speaking of Kindrel, you know, um, they have, uh, you know, like a lot of the tech stocks have been doing pretty well. You know, let, let's. Oh well, the whole year has been yeah, been I mean, mad. Yeah, dampened, dampened a little bit by 
you know, supply chain if you're if you're a you know personal consumer. Yeah, you're buying, selling yeah, so Apple, physical things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chips and all that stuff yeah. that everybody knows about. It. But Kindle, as you know, they're kind of out on their own now. Uh, they out of IBM at nineteen, as as uh, Mark Schroeder calls it, a nineteen billion revenue startup. That's I thought that was quite funny when he said that. But their but their stock price is down forty percent since they. That went but since their symbol KD. Mm. So I think pe- people are saying they're undervalued though. Well, that the valuation working. of four billion, yeah, and revenues of nineteen billion. So they have a point three uh, x valuation on, on revenue, which is it's lower than some of their comparisons like DXE or something. Yeah, yeah. So because we, we looked at this at the last show, we talked about the the, the value. They, sh- yeah. they should actually there should be value there somewhere. What's going on? What do we, what do people think? I mean, you, you, you. I believe you met them in well, Paris there yeah, the week. I mean, obviously, you know, obviously, <laughs> Kindle want to make a big splash now. Like they're out on the road. Yeah, a new some, brand. some you got to do some brand damage some, some, out there. Yeah, you get your name in it. So I'm, I'd say they were dominating the show you were at. Was that Crip, which is you know, it's a, a nice little event in Paris, and uh, we had our stand there, and uh, eventually found the Kindle, the little Kindle stand over in the uh, kind of far little corner. Well, they had a small little discreet stand in the oh, right. far corner of the room. I, like there was enough for a couple of people on there, so you know <laughs> they were there. Um, so yeah, so they're obviously not spending too much on trade shows. Uh, they must be saving it all for I don't know a rainy day or something else. Maybe um, maybe a re a maybe a rebrand. Yeah, I did speak to them, and they all seem to be in you know good good spirits. But uh, but look, they're, so they're trying to rebrand themselves. They're trying to change their image. They're trying to. Uh, be more kind of open. They're forming partnerships with other cloud providers. They're big, actually, they're, what they're doing is they're, they're forming partnerships with the bigger cloud players, mm. right? Amazon, Microsoft, those that are beating them. And uh, and it seems that IBM are doing the exact same. Uh, quite interesting that IBM is saying they are now at peace, not war, with the other cloud vendors. But, but they're competition. How can you be at peace? Well, yeah. I mean, like two months ago, all roads led to IBM Cloud. because uh, point, point, point 0.7% growth, yeah? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, obviously, very small tertiary roads yeah. led to IBM Cloud. But, uh, you know, so when Kindle was part of IBM and it was just GTS, everything was like, it's the IBM Cloud. Yeah. It's, you know, it's one way, one way street. But now they're saying, no, no, we're open to listening to customers understanding that what their destination is what their journey is and where we can fit on that journey so IBM is going to become a reseller it sounds like they're going to become a reseller, a reseller of it. Google and Amazon yeah, or, and like AWS referral deals or something get like 10, 10 basis points wow so I, 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 I honestly think this is like the road to nowhere I mean really really I mean if you I mean as an ex IBMer now I am disgusted disgusted um, is there any good news from IBM at all no Nothing. Like, well, I tried to find some. I, mean, ah, even, 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 I did find one. Oh, did you? oh, I do. I have one story that you didn't know about. Yeah. Arvind Krishna was voted as the number two CEO in the big tech space. Two? Yeah. Right. Ahead of Satya Nadella. That is hard. So the employees of IBM have, se- have voted. Which ones? <laughs> The ones that are still have their job, <laughs> not the ones that they they removed from their job. Right. What's the term you used before? Resource action. The resource action. Okay. So basically, what you're saying is nobody that's currently filing a uh, age discrimination mm-hmm. case are they didn't vote seeking repayment of non paid commission. They didn't vote. They're twenty something. They work in AI and yeah. cloud. Yeah. And they were allowed to vote. They work in the cloud. They're growing at point seven percent. They voted. They voted, and they said he must. Do you know what? Actually, I must say though. To be fair, yeah. he must be a really, really, really nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll, yeah. mo- we'll move on. We'll move on. We'll move on. We're having too much fun. Uh, the big thing, the big news we were talking about all, all, all year is the right to repair. I mean, that has come yeah. massively on, on the agenda. We've seen all the things in the US uh, with Lena Khan. We had, I think, at the beginning of the year, we talked a lot about this with mm-hmm. uh, Senator Morelli p- putting his fair repair bill through. Loads and loads of things happening. I mean, we've got nearly 20 states looking to push it through at, at local level, at, set, at state level. And here in Europe, we've seen right to repair is all over 
the kind of commission roadmap of 2022. Yeah. You've got laws in Europe, like the French Repairability Index, which is like on electronic goods that you actually have to have, get like the energy rating, the repairability rating. And there's talk that that's going to become across Europe at a consumer level. So there's huge amounts of things happening there. And I just think it's, uh, if I was making a prediction, I think this is going to get even hotter. I mean, one of the things that's, that scared me, at least during the year when I was looking at this stuff, because we, we don't look at, we don't think about technology necessarily as an industry that, has a, that traditionally had an environmental impact. So, except that in the data center, you're looking at innovation around technology, a lot of it, if you go back like you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was all about green IT. I don't know if you remember the green IT movement it was about 10 or 15 years ago. And the idea around green IT was Consoli- like virtualization, consolidation. It was around a bit of more energy efficiency. And there's been huge leaps in that area. The problem is the consumption leap outstripped the ability of the industry to actually reduce the consumption. I don't know whether you know this. The tech industry today has a bigger, more impactful, negative environmental impact than the airline industry. Yeah. Today, today. 40% is, I think is the number of global carbon emissions are from the ICT are certainly by 20 well, 2040 it'll 2040, be 14 40%. yeah it'll be it's going to be one of the biggest in the, of any industry so right. the trajectory on it I mean it, it can do many things for lots and lots of other industries like technology itself you know re, re, zoom which we talked about beginning all the remote tools that we you know teams etc all these tools allow people to stay and work from home so the environment but the problem is the consumption of Technology is still like we're re- refreshing technology too, too, too frequently. I did a, a conference, um, I joined a, a workshop at a conference in Paris when you were over at Crip. I did one online with SIGREF, an organization, another French organization. And there's a concept they have in France, which is quite interesting. I mean, I don't know, I don't know whether it will take off or not as a concept globally called digital sobriety. So the concept is about we recognize that we're going to use more technology. That's going to happen, right? But there's actually got to be an element of how do you use, consume more technology without consuming technology? Do you know what I mean? So what, in simple terms, it's like make you know, the devices we use and the technology we use, we need to be using for longer. We need to recognize actually every time we make a change. You know, this is a new law happening, for example, in, in Portugal. I don't know if you know about this. This is where they're suggesting potentially they're going to create new law that says you can't actually talk to your employees after their finish for their hours of work so you can't communicate with them so you know if you give them a, mo- a mobile device you need to probably then give them to give them a dedicated work device you won't allow them to use their own so suddenly we're like we're creating laws on one hand that drives up consumption on the other hand and um, so it's about getting a much more kind of consolidated view of all that you know and the amount of price gouging that goes on in the industry uh, yeah i mean the people the reason people don't uh, repair devices or one that hasn't been possible to date uh, it's also been too expensive you, you, you know you try and replace a battery or, or a screen and you might as well nearly buy a new phone so people are just chucking phones in the drawer and yeah. you know buying a new one you yeah. know, it's just too much hassle yeah. you know, but and if we had sat here which we did in December last year we wouldn't you would never have predicted for example that someone like Microsoft would start to work and make their products their harder products more repairable which they've done with the Surface to be fair or you would never predict what happened a number of weeks ago with, with Apple coming out saying they're now taking a, taking a leap forward and going to make their products more repairable. Yeah, they're right. going to share information. They're going to, yeah, yeah, they're yeah. going to stop, you know, manufacturers are going to stop gluing everything together yeah. or making the screw that you just cannot take out because yeah, yeah. or you can't, can't the, 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 it's got the brand new type of screwdriver. You know, yeah. all of these things. Yeah. So you're starting to see the industry mm. recognising there's a trend here. Mm. The smart guys are going, right, we've got to move yeah, with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the exciting thing, though, for us in our business is actually that's exactly what we do. We extend the life of technology. We, our whole model is based on don't make a change. Keep what you have. And I think that, that concept, it's not for everywhere because, of course, you've got to make changes. But it's about changing everything for change's sake. Where can you actually keep things for longer? Where can you use things for longer? That's going to be part of the solution. And in some cases, you're going to have to potentially pay more today for things. Like where you know, we're looking at technology that goes into the Internet of Things. Mm-hmm. I know it's an industry you know well because you worked in it for a number of years and a brand of business in that space. 
one of the challenges they have is that they've done some research. The European Commission, because you know I'm involved with the multi-stakeholder platform for standard IT, ICT standardization, long kind of name. Anyway, so there's a number of uh, European uh, com- uh, Commission staff on that who are involved in sust- IT sustainability, IT standards. And one of the things they're looking at is IoT. And they did some research in Europe around, would you, they did to ask two questions. Would you be prepared to pay more money today for a product that was repairable in the future? And the answer was no. No, No, surprisingly. Most people said no. But then they asked a separate question and they said, well, in the future, if you found out the decision that you made five years ago around technology, you bought something that then had an environmental impact at that point in the future, who would you blame? They would blame, not themselves, but the policy holders and and decision makers and politicians. So that's a really that's a that's a strange conundrum to uncrack that. So what that requires though is leadership. It requires leadership in the likes of Brussels and Europe, it requires leadership in obviously now in the UK and London, and leadership in, in Washington and elsewhere to actually then say make make some of these decisions for us. And I think if you if you started to do that, like for example, the situation we're in with the hospitals all over the world, hospitals are under pressure. We're blaming policymakers for not making enough investment in policy. Yet at the time, going back, if you'd asked us, do you want to spend more money in hospitals five years ago? We said no. Mm. You know, so you need people to make decisions for you mm. to some degree yeah, yeah. and make the right decisions. So yeah. I think you're going to see much more of this happening in 2022. Yeah, I think it's probably the strongest prediction we're going to have. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's a good one. To also, and I think there's going to be a reset in terms of, you know, the, in the tech industry. I just can't see it continuing to increase. I think people are going to look, start looking outside of US-based internet companies for, for investments in the future. I think it's nearly at the, nearly at the top. Uh, I think because of the, some of the things around supply chain and human resource issues and so forth, I think people are going to look, start looking at other industries. So my prediction is it's, it's, it's not going to keep wrapping at, at the state that it has this year. I mean, this year alone, tech revenues across the big five is up 26%. It's, it's up to 1.27 trillion. I, I don't see that continuing into the future. Yeah. So my prediction is that will flatten out a little bit. And you know what, though? This IT sustainability uh, might create the opportunity for new companies to be well, that's, well, that's very awesome. valuable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You never know. On that note, we've got to say goodbye. 2021 is over. Goodbye, 21. 2021. <laughs> we look forward to 22. I hope and I expect 22 to be a far better year. Thank you very much for everybody listening, Brendan. It's been a good year. Thanks, Ruth Moss. Yeah. And uh, thanks for our production team. Oh, yeah. My, so Michael, Michael, particularly. In yeah. The background here. Yeah. Listening to us and recording us. And, and, and to Uva for getting us going again. Our, if we, maybe yeah, we... To Uva for encouraging us to come out this Friday and do this podcast. Thank you, Uva. <laughs> <laughs> I won't forget it. Excellent. We'll leave it there. So. Happy New Year, James. Happy New Year. Take care. Bye bye.